Housekeeping first, excuse me. As many of you know that we are doing this quarter a look at marriage and relationships. And um, we're going to do something a little different today. First of all, it's not going to just be me talking. And, um, but we're going to look at the idea of legacy, the idea of passing the torch from one generation to the next, from passing on from one marriage to the next. The idea that marriages bless not only the people that are in them today, but down the line as well. So let's begin with the word of prayer, and I want to tell you a story. Dear Holy Father, we thank you that you are a God of love, that you are a God of a relationship, that you are a God who desires to know us and to be with us from generation to generation. And so today, Lord, we just simply ask that as we, as we share scripture, as we share stories, that you will be glorified. In the name of Amen. There is a story that I have heard many, many, many times in my family. And it has to do with my paternal grandfather, my dad's dad. For us, growing up, I don't know where the phrase came from, but he was called Pappy to us. Um, I don't know exactly what you would call the kind of farming that he did, but he ran another individual's farm. He lived on the land, he lived in the home, they did the crops, they did the animals, whatever it was. And then obviously there's some sort of a sharing relationship with income. And um, one particular night, middle of the night, there was a banging on their door, on the farmhouse door, waking the family up, and it was a couple men banging on the door, screaming and hollering, the barn's on fire, the barn's on fire. Now, this is out very rem remote and rural. And there's some feeling that the reason that these two men knew that the barn was on fire was because they were in the barn and set the fire. Somehow. No one knows whether it's accidental or whether it was on purpose. But at least they had the decency to bang on the door saying, your barn's on fire, your barn's on fire, and then they disappeared. And so now the family comes out. There's no fire hydrant outside the, the farmhouse. There's nothing they can do except get stuff out of the barn, fight what little fire they could fight, and watch the barn burn to the ground. It was not only their livelihood, but it was a barn owned by someone else. And for years, that's where the story ended, with the barn burning and, and the impact on their family. And it wasn't too terribly long before my pappy died. And I don't even know if I was in the room. I want to say I was. One day, my dad asked his dad. He said, when the barn burned, he said, we couldn't find you for a long, long time. 
And he said, we, there was some concern that you may have actually burned up in the barn trying to get animals and equipment out. Where were you after the barn fire? And I'm going to stop with the story for just a second and tell you that my grandpa, my dad's dad, was not the kind of man who would sit up here and do this at all. He wasn't the kind of guy who would go door to door handing out leaflets. He wasn't the kind of guy who um, was overtly extroverted, if you want to call it, with his faith. But he told my dad, and it's something that has stuck with me, to the answer of where in the world were you? We thought you had died in the fire. We thought you had burned in the fire. And he said, buddy, my dad often would go by buddy. He said, I was out back of the, where the barn used to be. And he said, I was laying down in the wet grass. And he said, I was sobbing and begging God, what are we going to do now? How are we going to survive? How, how am I going to feed my kids? The barn has burned. And he said, where was I that night after the barn burned? He said, me and God, I was begging with him, please, what are we going to do? And that story, the second half of the story, has stuck with me for years with the idea that my grandpa, who on the outside didn't appear to be a man of faith, truly was. And at a time where the barn is on the ground, his first reaction was to talk to God and say, now what? I want to share with you a couple verses. And Joy, as usual, our Sabbath school lessons and our sermons, and we don't plan them, have been overlapping. So we're going to look at a few verses that we looked at during Sabbath school as well. Turn with me in your Bibles to Genesis 12. I think the guys will have it up on the screen too, but if you like to have that scripture in your hand. And looking at the idea of a God that wants us to pass things on for generations to go. Genesis 12, I'm going to read verses 2 and 3. It says, I will make you a great nation. Now he's talking to Abraham here. I will make you a great nation and I will bless you and make your name great and you shall be a blessing. And I will bless those who bless you, and I will curse him who curses you. I think Etienne was the one, and Joy was the one that said, that little section right there says, God has your back. Don't worry about it. So your barn burns, God has your back. And it says, I will curse him who curses you, and in you all the families of the earth shall be blessed. You began to see that, that the covenant that promise, that relational covenant that was established with Abraham was going to be passed down from one family to the next, from one married couple to the next. Then we're going to go over to Genesis 17, 7. Very, very similar. Genesis 17, 7 says, And I will establish my covenant between me and you and your descendants after you in their generation for an everlasting covenant to be God to you and your descendants after you. God's heart is that through families, generation to generation, the covenant love that we have experienced will be passed down. And that there's no better vehicle on earth than the family for love and faith and honor and things like that to be passed down. One last text. Some of you have heard me share this text before. This was a text that became very meaningful to me when Emmeline was born. I got her attention. <laughs> when Emmeline was born <clears throat> and the other su successive two grandkids in our family because it suddenly dawned to me that I was no longer a dad. I was a grandpa. That's a scary concept. Uh, some of you are great-grandparents. It's, it's even scary, my mom says. Okay. Um, I hope I have a few years before that comes along. Um, but my, 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 the thought of, for me was, what is it that I'm supposed to do now? I don't have the direct, I don't have the direct 
responsibility. And look at Deuteronomy 6. And I'm going to read verses 4 through 9. And it says, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. And here's this idea of covenant love that comes up. It says, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your strength. Okay, so I do. Now what am I supposed to do about it? Is that, is that something that I just internalize? What happens next? Reading on in verse 6. And these words which I command you today shall be in your heart. You shall teach them diligently to your children and shall talk of them when you sit in your house, when you walk by the way, when you lie down, and when you rise up. You shall bind them as a sign on your hand and they shall be as frontlets between your eyes. You shall write them on the doorpost of your house and on your gates. Suddenly, Scripture is telling us, make it real. Let it be seen in your house. Let it be heard in your house. Pass on. And the reason this was being told to them is that here the Israelites are getting ready to cross over into the promised land. And he's telling the Israelites, share your stories of faith. Share what God has done. Share the good and the bad. Share what you have learned about God because your family is headed into new territory. Totally new territory. And they need to hear from you the stories of faith and what God has done for you. And I, I look at Matthew 1, and you look at, and you don't need to go there, but that's the genealogy of, of Christ. And every time, for a long time, if I was reading through the Bible, or even just reading Matthew, I'd skip that. I had just a bunch of names. And here recently, it has, it has come to my understanding, that's 14 earthly generations. And that is... That is the, the, the path of generations where the passing on of faith between good people and scoundrels, you name it, we're in that list. But it took 14 families, 14 marriages, 14 steps to bring the story of faith down to where we then find Jesus Christ, the son of David, and the son of Abraham as our savior. And so, for the rest of this time, you guys can grab mics if you want. Or if you don't want to, you still have to, Jamie. <laughs> How did I get them up here? I don't know. Uh, God moves in mysterious ways. And, um, and a little bribery. Uh, <laughs> no money involved. Bird is cooking lunch for them. I don't know what that has to do with it, so. And I even asked them if they'd be willing to do Facebook Live this afternoon, and they just went, okay. Yeah. <laughs> but the legacy of our marriage and relationships, I believe, is an extension of God's covenant love. And through our marriages, and we're going to be talking too about family as well today, but through our marriages and through our families is how that love, how our faith is passed on. And so with a lot of stories, maybe a few texts, we're going to talk about today your family, our families, and, and how the torch is passed. And I want to say something right up front. We're sitting up here because we said yes. <laughs> we're, we're not sitting up here because we have it all figured out. Um, there's, going to be a, there's going to be a question a little bit about skunks in the woodpile. And we have them too. And, and we're not perfect. But we're, we're here to share some stories, some observations about how faith and a lot of other things have been passed down through the generations. So let me ask a first question. How have tough times shaped our family legacy? Are you speaking of uh, the one that you and I share, or all of us share together? It could be. It could be either, or it could be one. Could you realize there are three generations here, 
There's a fourth generation plane and coloring on the floor over there. You have a fifth generation that would be my grandparents. So anything's game right now. Well, the first thing I think of probably is my own grandfather, grandfather Antit, who came from Germany when he was a young man. He was 23. He and his brother came because they didn't want to be in the Kaiser's army, army and they came to the United States. And as was customary then, when you landed in New York, if you didn't have a job, farmers would wait there to hire you. So he was hired by a Vermont farmer. And that was not an easy life. He didn't know English well, I'm sure. And he uh, worked for this man for four years, in spite of the difficulties that there must have been in communicating with him. I've often thought about that farmer that hired him. What did he, how did he tell him what he wanted him to do? I don't think that farmer knew German. <laughs> but my grandpa was willing to do this in spite of the difficulties that it was causing him to do. In our own, this generation's of family, probably the hardest thing that Larry and I ever went through was the loss of our son. But I, when I thought about that, I thought my grandpa went through difficult times too and God was with him the whole way and I think it, when you have the assurance that God is with you you can tolerate a lot of things that you couldn't otherwise do you agree Jamie yeah and this question I think was probably one of the harder ones for me because I knew that there would be stories similar to that coming back from your family but for Andrew and I the tough times don't look anything like that <laughs> um, COVID, um, you know, uh, some difficulties in finding work at, you know, in the early days of our marriage, but all in all, they don't seem that tough when compared. But I think the thing that hit me about this topic specifically is that it's because the generations before us went through mm -hmm. those times and worked through those times and now are set up a lot better that they're able to help us. So. It could be just kind of where we are um, in the world right now or in our life right now, but I also think that the fact that we haven't had those tough times like what you're describing might be in part to that we have parents and grandparents that have worked so hard that are able to, to come to our aid and, and work us through the tough times. The one thing I am very good, sad about, I never got to meet my grandpa Antit or my grandma. They died before my mother was married, so I never got to know him and hear stories firsthand from him. And that I greatly re regret because I think had I been able to do that, his stories would have had even more meaning and more impact on my own life had that been possible. There's a story in my, my memory bank that it, I guess it always fascinated me because I, I guess I always thought growing up that you know, money grew in tree and it was always there. And uh, long before I came along, it was just my mom and dad and my brother Jeff. And if you don't know, pastors get paid once a month. I think it's still that way. So if you don't budget your money, or if you have an unexpect unexpected expense, the check could still be two to three <laughs> weeks off. And I remember vividly the story that it was just a few days before a paycheck and there was food in the cupboard but there was no food for my brother Jeff and there no milk and there was no money to get that because the check was still just a few days off and I remember vividly as a kid knowing and hearing the story that my mom and dad prayed and they began looking you know, seat cushions, pockets, you name it. And finding enough money to get food for my brother Jeff. And I don't know why that story made such an impact. You know, I don't ever remember that happening when I was a kid. Somehow they magically took a minister's salary and fed four boys who had terrible appetites or good appetites. But um, the idea that my mom and dad went through tough times sustained me, helped me to know what it was like when Bert and I have heard the sound of bouncing checks and things like that in our lives. Okay. 
What meaningful traditions have, have you seen passed down through the generations in our family? Go ahead. Um, the first two I thought of would be um, probably through the Yeagley side, the Friday night dinners is one that um, sticks with me, and then the, the blessing that we do um, when the, all the cousins have turned 12, doing the blessing. Explain what that is. So for me and all of our cousins, whenever we turned 12, the family would have a blessing, and we would all get together, and everybody in the family would write a letter um, to the child that was turning 12, um, talking about them, talking about what they were committing to to do as far as like their support for us as we grew up and um, then we all we put them together in a notebook um, and so we each have our little notebook with the letters that were written from all of our family members um, blessing us and giving their support. Yeah, and I can remember, you know, because at 12 years old the last thing in the world you want to be is the center of attention, usually. And it was awful. <laughs> it, was, it was awful. But let, Weston, let me ask you a question. Do you think you could put your hand on the book that was put together for you? He said, yes. I don't see any of the other cousins here. But it was an amazing thing, even though that was just terrible to put these poor kids in the center, the center of a living room floor and everybody reads these letters and they're just like, is there a hole that can swallow me? Um, because it was embarrassing to some degree. But when, some, when a nephew or a niece of mine knew that they were next, that was pretty special for them. Because they knew they were the next 12th birthday in the family. And then they got to be embarrassed. <laughs> when I think of traditions, I think of food. And there were food traditions that came down through the family. Uh, one of which was, um, was something that when Brian would eat it at college, they would turn up their nose. But my grandmother came from Virginia, and so it was very common to have cottage cheese and apple butter. Yes. <laughs> and, um, and some people just cringe when I say that. But that was a Saturday, always Saturday night, we had cottage cheese and apple butter, among other things. And that was a tradition. And as you can see, Brian loves it. He if, would if, eat it in college and his... If you want to gross out a table at Andrews University of, of your friends, eat cottage cheese and apple butter and it'll, <laughs> empty, it'll clear a table pretty it, quick. It stopped at this generation. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, it, you can see some traditions don't go on forever, as she said. <laughs> but it came down at least as far as, as this generation. Well, at least it's not a salvation issue. So... <laughs> But, and, and the other thing I think about when I think about food is as when you talk about things not going down generations, my mother coming from, from Vermont thought that things like turnips and, um, what's the other thing that I can't, say? anyway, she loved them and I thought, who on earth invented that vegetable? And so it went as far as my mother's generation and no further. Um, but Praise food the Lord. is often past I, food ideas are those of you who come who have grandparents who came from some other country you know you have enjoyed some of those fun things that have come down through your family and I think food can often be uh, a legacy that you get from one person to another I um, I can't I was trying to think about something else that we ate that was very unique to our particular ones, but, oh, I know. When I was a little girl, after my grandfather died, my grandfather, my paternal grandfather died, my grandmother was living alone. And so on Sabbath afternoon, we would sometimes go over to see her. And I'm sure she didn't have this every Sabbath, but boy, I would have eaten if she had. She would make a, from scratch, chocolate cake, and then she made a lime sherbet, which I, that combination, I could have eaten it day after day. And I loved that lime sherbet so much that I got that recipe from her and then lost it. And I was very disappointed because it was quite easy to do. 
I went online this week and I thought, I bet I can find that again. And sure enough, somebody posted and said, if anybody has ever made this, can you give me the recipe? And somebody did, it's very simple. It is lime jello, it is canned milk and water, and, you, and, some of, and a little bit of, I think, and a little bit of salt. And you freeze it until it just starts to freeze and then you bring it out of the freezer and whip it up so it's nice and smooth and soft and you put it back in the freezer again. And you can make it with any flavor of jello, I'm sure, but oh, when I think of eating that, I think that was just to me, heaven on Sabbath afternoon, to have that. <laughs> so when was the last time you got a recipe at church, so, you know. <laughs> <laughs> but I, I think for many of us, legacy is involved with food in some way or another in your own families. There are things, some of you have been fortunate enough to have grandmothers of, of various um, ethnicities that have allowed you to enjoy food that maybe you wouldn't have enjoyed otherwise. And so it is a real legacy. Yeah, in, in, in my life, legacy did afford me things that we weren't allowed in, o in other parts of our life. Oh yes, tell we about that. Um, <laughs> at my grandparents, my mom's parents' breakfast table you know, the Yagleys, we ate pretty basic. You know, if you had dry cereal, it might be shredded wheat. <laughs> it might be Cheerios, you know, that kind of stuff. You know. But at my grandmother's table, there were at least two feet, three feet of cereal boxes, cocoa crisps, you know, all the good stuff. And so that was a tradition that uh, we, would, we would have walked to my grandparents to get the cereal at the table. But anyway. I got another question. I'm going to throw this one at you, and I'm not, um, this was not on your list. Oh, lovely. <laughs> how, has, how has legacy, how, have, how did generations affect your work ethic? And I'll start, oh. I'll start. Growing up, my grandfather on my mom's side was an electrician. Um, he was quirky, he was eccentric in many ways, but he was very, very good. And I remember being s so proud and so impressed that my grandpa designed a wheelchair for a, a quadriplegic that could be, I believe, moved and directed by breath only, something to that effect. And I remember holding and reading the letter from President Nixon, thanking him for what he had done. I don't know the storyline behind how that letter came to be. I just remember being so incredibly proud of my grandpa, who despite his wanting to teach me trigonometry at five years old and being frustrated that I didn't get it, I was so proud of what my grandpa did for a living. And that's a story that has always stuck with me. Jamie? <laughs> Again, I, haven't, I did not give them this question ahead. Well, I mean, right off the top of my head, I can, and I feel like it, the, the two things that I'm thinking of are almost at war with each other, but I, I always heard my mom say that, that her dad taught her to, to do a good job, do, you know, do your work um, and do a good job at it regardless of pay and um, appreciation, you know, just to kind of buckle down and work. And I've heard that a lot growing up um, and try to apply it. I'm probably not really good at that. But then, Grandma, you're, you're a go-getter too. <laughs> so I feel like at the same time, I often get advice to, you know, at the same time kind of stand up for myself and, and push for what I think is right in whatever circumstance I'm going through at work. So trying to kind of balance those two. <laughs> <laughs> because I, it, he talked about my dad, my mother was one who was willing to take on extra responsibilities um, in her life, in our home. As you've heard me tell once before in Sabbath school, that I saw a list she had made of 30 some people who at one time or another stayed in our home either sometimes just for a day, sometimes for longer than that. That is an accomplishment I don't think I would ever want to brag to. But she, she was willing to, ex to reach out to people all around her 
we always, it's so interesting to me, Sabbath was very, a Sabbath dinner was very special at our house. My mother always made a special dessert and, and made a special Sabbath dinner. We might or might not have company, but that food was always going to be there. And so she taught me a lot about cooking, about cleaning house, laundry. I remember our neighbor girl next door to me, we grew up together. She married before I did, and one day she, her mama had never asked her to even make her own bed. And so she had a pretty easy life, I thought. I was a little envious of Barbara. She didn't have to do anything. Her mama didn't expect anything of her. She would sometimes come over and help me with my jobs so that I would have free time sooner. But when she got married, she came to me one time and said, I don't know what I'm gonna do. She said, I don't know how to do anything. <laughs> and she was really distressed. She said, I, I don't know how, how to clean house. I, I, I never learned to do any of these things. And at that point, I was, ex again, very st extremely grateful to a mother who taught me how to work. Because I looked at this poor girl and thought, she's really having a tough time she shouldn't have to have. Mm -hmm. OK, let's veer now back to really kind of the heart, for just a little while, of the power of legacy, the power of generation to generation to generation. And as Deuteronomy 6 said, it is the idea and it is the vehicle that faith is passed from one generation to the next. The stories of faith, the scriptures, the statutes, the commandments, as, as the Bible says. How has, how have your faith been strengthened over the generations? What, what, have, what have future or past generations done to strengthen your faith? You know, because my grandfather, my paternal grandfather, was wise enough or smart enough to put together, a, I guess, three notebooks of family history, which has made it very, some very interesting reading at times. Uh, yeah discover things you never knew had happened in your family, which some of them you just assumed you didn't know. But, um, but because I know a lot more a about my father's family than I know about my mother's family, I realized that these were people of faith. And even in the case of my grandfather, Antit, my grandmother was a Seventh-day Adventist. My grandfather, Antit, was not. But he never um, apparently opposed her worship or her going to church or anything, but he never chose to do that. And so I look at my grandmother, Antit, and realize that she had to live her religion before my grandfather because he was not going to go to, go to church and hear anything. Hmm. He would only know what he saw in my grandmother. That had a profound effect on me, realizing that you can talk all you want, but your life had better say something that you really wanted to say. And I think mm -hmm. that was, for me, a, a very important lesson. I had my great-great-grandmother was one of the apparently one of the first people to accept the Sabbath um, in Battle Creek when they held a series of meetings. Her husband did not. He did not choose to be baptized or join the church. But the story is that he did keep the Sabbath with her. Why he never chose to take any further step, I, of course, I don't know. But obviously, her life was a testament to him of what a Christian is. And I, it has always made me think, my life had better be that too, because my words mean nothing if my life doesn't. Mm -hmm. Jamie? Um, I don't. I don't have as much to say on that, other than I just think. I mean, I've. It's. That's all I've ever known um, for my life, and you. You guys is too. Um, I just think it's been a safe place, I guess, to work through my my faith, and you know, kind of in that young adult phase of trying to then transition it to my grown-up faith, um, but it, I feel like within my family it's always just been a safe place where I can watch and see the faith of the elders and the other people in my family while kind of safely exploring it for myself. Yeah. 
we are as interested in you guys. Have, you guys have all experienced this. A lot of you have. Um, it's interesting. Sometimes um, Emmeline is, is really the one who will have the conversation. It's Harper. Harper's really just interested in watching cats and dogs on my phone right yet right now. But um, to, to have conversations of, about faith with a five-year-old is really not only sobering but encouraging. You realize that every word and every action has meaning. And that's whether you're a grandparent, a great-grandparent, or a parent, or quite frankly, us as church members to these kids. It's the same thing. Um, Laura, when I saw you um, working from here with your kids, it, it, I, I immediately thought of what I wanted to share. The Yeagley kids always sat on the front row when my dad was a pastor. And um, that was because, yes, we wanted to be not seen, but that was because my dad had ways of keeping us in line when my mom couldn't. And he's on the platform, and we're on the front row, and with looks and motions and things that no one else in the congregation could tell what was going on, my dad could keep the Yagley boy straight on the front row. <laughs> but, but you know, my dad was my first pastor. Um, and I, to me, I look at my dad's theology, if you want to call it, my dad's approach to faith has been very instrumental and very um, powerful to me. You know, my as I wrote here, my first pastor taught me to care first and then, and then do other things. And um, so I think faith is, is really the, the big thing. But I want to ask a, another totally unrelated question. You told me about, I think it was HMS Richard Sr. has a, a saying that says there's a skunk in every woodpile. Can God use failed people to build a family legacy from marriage to marriage? Without naming names of anyone in the room that you're related to, what, what did you learn from the skunks in your woodpile? Well, it's interesting because when I was a little girl, I knew that my great-grandmother was a sister to the Kellogg men. And I used to kind of be a little bit proud about that, you know, <laughs> until I got older. And I learned more about the Kellogg brothers. And I learned that they could be skunks in the woodpile to each other and to other people as well. So then when we lived in Battle Creek, I learned not to mention that I even knew the Kellogg brothers. <laughs> <laughs> because uh, there were people in that town who had had um, association with them, let's put it that way, and we did not think of them kindly. And so I, I learned that there are people in your life that you are not necessarily the best ones to have around. Um, but I, and the other thing I was telling Brian, I learned just recently, my great-grandfather was, was going to be inducted into the Army during the time of the uh, Civil War. And my grandfather kept a copy of the, the sheet that he got telling him he had to report for this. And he did, he reported. And they tested him, as my grandfather put, they had him hop on one foot. I guess that was to prove that he had some sort of agility in getting around. And then they said, all right, you're fine. You're going to be a part of the Army. And he said, well, just a minute. He said, I'm a Seventh-day Adventist, and I don't believe in bearing arms. And they said, oh, all right. You pay us $300 for someone else to do. And so he did. I asked Brian to look up and see what that would be equivalent to in today's money. He said that'd be about $6,500. And then I got to thinking after I read that, he did that. He did not have to go into the army, but some other young man did. And I've always wondered, it's bothered me, did that young man lose his life? And my grandfather didn't, my great-grandfather didn't, I don't know. Whether he's a, a skunk in the woodpile or not depends on your view 
of war and participating in it. But that's always been a story that has just kind of bothered me at the back of my mind. I'll never know the answer to that, I suppose, until heaven. But did someone else, did he benefit from someone else's tragedy? And I don't know that. So that would be my two skunks in the woodpile. I ran across something this week. You go back to Matthew 1, and you go back to the genealogy of Jesus. Mm -hmm. 14 generations. And what I read was, was titled, The Gnarled Family Tree of Jesus. 14 generations includes the following. Liar, deceiver, schemer, faithful followers, murderers, adulterer, kinsman redeemer, idol worshipers, child sacrificers, reformers, polygamist, and prostitute. So we all have skunks in the woodpile. Sometimes we're the skunk in the woodpile. And God still has the ability to, um, to build a legacy through our marriages, to build a legacy through our family despite our failings. Because in some ways, it's not just us that's a legacy. It's Christ in us that is the legacy. Look at David. Look at a lot of the people in the Bible who were far from perfect, who still passed on a legacy. Look at those 14 generations in Matthew 1. There's a lot of scoundrels in that list. But there are still scoundrels that were able to pass on a legacy. They were the lineage of our Savior. Okay, just a few more questions, not many more. We're all parents. How has, how has generations of legacy in your family shaped your parenting? Damien, you can take that one first. <laughs> um, I think it's, it come, boils down to maybe just like the, the style of parenting that I've obviously picked up um, from my parents. The ability to go to them and grandparents for advice when I'm not sure what to do, when times are tough. Um, I also think being a part of a really large family has helped with that. Um, not necessarily that they, they all have to parent my kids, but the time spent um, with family and, and the interactions that they get there, I think have been really, really helpful for my girls. Um, and we kind of all rely on that. Now the girls are like, who's coming over? Where, where are we going tonight? Are we getting together with the family? Um, so that's just played a huge, huge part um, in their life and mine. Well, and I have, se I have seen that. Again, it's, it's so interesting to watch. And this is now going to broaden the circle. To look at my nephews and nieces and their level of interaction with the next generation, which is now three of my grandkids. Um, their deep love for, respect for these, these kids. Um, really at three generations now four generations actually. And it's amazing to see the impact that we have, not because we're perfect, but simply because we spend time and interest in their lives. I look at what happens inside this church, this church family. I look at when you pay attention to kids and you know their names, the impact that it has is phenomenal. My mother did not ever really give me parenting advice. The one time in my parenting that I remember that she challenged my parenting is forever um, seared in my mind because apparently she didn't do it very often. We were visiting and boy number three had set up some sort of an arrangement on the floor with his cars and so forth. He had it just the way he wanted. This was not boy number three. This was, But anyway, boy number three Boy number four came along and disarranged it. And boy number three was pretty mad, and I and reached out and swatted his younger brother and so forth. So I scolded him for that behavior. And my mother said to me, now just a minute. <laughs> she said, he had that all set up nice, and his younger brother came along and messed it up, and you're after him? 
What about the, the other one? And that's the only time I ever remember her challenging my parenting. But she was right. I had gone after the guy who was the loudest first and not the one that was the real culprit. And so I learned from her to be careful in my parenting and be careful in my punishments. But she, because she always had, she helped to raise my niece and nephew. She had, there were just always kids around. And she was Aunt Ruth to them, all of them. Everybody knew her as Aunt Ruth. I, I, I guess her grandkids may have called her grandma, but everybody else called her Aunt Ruth. I watched her patience in dealing with all of these children that came into our home at different times. And it helped me to remember that what I did and what I said was very important. I want to ask one last question. Because I know some families have, have had intact families for generation and generations. Mm -hmm. Other families have had checkered pasts, if you want to call it. And my question is this. Does being single, divorced, or widowed impact your ability to share and pass along legacy through generations? I certainly hope not, because there have been people in my life who are all, may have been in one of those categories, who have made an impact on my life. If it's, it's not just my parents. I have often said, I am so grateful for the people in my son's lives who had the impact. Teachers, you name it, all sorts of people. I, I learned very early that my impact on their life is important but not the only Im impact, and the only important impact. Every one of you have an impact on the children in the church. I don't care if you're related to them or not. And I think that's really important for us to recognize that even if you're not a parent, or even if you've never been a parent, or any of those things, you still have an impact on the generations beneath you. Agree. <laughs> agree, oh, agree, okay. <laughs> I, um, I have known many people over my life who, who have failed, who have mis made mistakes. I think that that is not where legacy comes from. Legacy comes from what you do when you pick yourself back up, what you do when you ask God for forgiveness, what you do when you move on is where legacy and um, value is placed through the generations in your family. Um, you know, for, for many of our church members, they are a widowed grandmother or grandfather. Uh, a grandma has died. And their, their input and their value in the family is just as important um, as it was when, when there was a husband and a wife. Um, you know, and, and I have learned things about my own family as I've gotten older. And I've learned that they were human. They made mistakes. Um, they weren't near as perfect as I thought they were when they gave me three feet of, you know, cereal that I liked, you know. But, um, but that still makes them valuable. They still have the ability to pass down legacy. You had a text that you were going to kind of close I with. To share. There is a legacy that we all have. It is invaluable to each one of us. And if you have your Bible open, open it to 1 Peter. Okay. I'm sorry, to 1 Peter. And I had this written down here. So, and verse 21. And it says, For you have been called for this purpose, since Christ also suffered for you, leaving you an example Follow in his steps. There is your legacy. Follow in his steps. It's true. And so I guess the challenge is simple. We're not perfect. Our families are not perfect. Um, and sometimes even the legacy that we pass on is not perfect. But if we get up every day and desire to walk in the steps the legacy 
the heritage, if you want to call it, that Christ has left for us, it enables us then to do the same thing in our marriages and for our families. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we simply come to you today saying, Lord, we need you in our lives. We are parents. We are grandparents, great-grandparents, aunts and uncles. We're just church friends that love each other. And may we, only because you are in our life, may we have a legacy to pass on. May for the next generations until you come back, may people know who you are through our actions. May they face tough times with courage because of our example. May they laugh because we laugh when times were tough. And may we then, as whole family units, spend eternity with you. In thy name, amen.